Welcome to the 11:30 uh, Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Doctrinal Bible Study, Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we're still under COVID. Uh, we meet on Sundays, but our Wednesday luncheon we have not been able to do that yet. We hope to get back to it, so we we still call it our luncheon uh, meeting Bible study. We hope to do that soon. I can tell you that because I missed that. Uh, today is the eighth lesson in a series entitled Grieving the Holy Spirit, taken from Ephesians 4.30. The greater passage that is important to this study of grieving the Holy Spirit. Actually, the greater passage begins in verse 17 and goes through 32. But I chose to start at verse 25 to go through 32 because of 11 imperatives. In verses 25 through 32, there are 11 imperatives and a, a Greek imperative, a command. And so that, the, ver, by the time we get to verses 25 through 32, we, Paul is really pounding uh, uh, commands out uh, for the church at Ephesus, things to live by, showing the things that he's showing from verse 25 through 32, he is showing... Uh, the, the sins that are embedded within believers' life from their former life, from their former life, th sins that have been embedded in them. And he mentions them in verse 31. He mentions six, what we call old man cosmos diabolica sins. In other words, sins that are connected to the former way of life that are still present in the Christian's life. And, and Paul says, root them out, get rid of them lift them up and remove them. And, and then in verse 32, where we are now, this is our second study in 32, he gives you the spiritual solution to the sins. In other words, up in, in verses 20 through 24, you remember his one Greek sentence, uh, Paul lays out a very important doctrinal principle, one of three fronts that may be, must be one in the Christian life, uh, you must walk in the spirit, not the flesh. One, uh, you must walk by faith, not sight. Two, you must put off the old man and put on the new man and walk in the new man. That's number three. So Paul is dealing with that in chapter four of Ephesians. So that's where we are, Ephesians four, uh, verses 25 through 32. And we have gone through and shown you the sins that grieve the Holy Spirit. And now... He's in a cluster of sins, which I refer to as the six deadly sins of the former life that are in there that are destroying relationships. Bitterness, wraft, anger, slander, clamor, malice, that type of thing. Verse 31. In verse 30, Paul has a, a, an imperative, a grieve not the Holy Spirit. And that's, of course, our subject matter. That's a present imperative. Second person, plural. Well, Paul taught in verse 32. I want to take a look at that for a moment. Open your Bibles. Uh, that's the last verse in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is quite a dynamite passage, by the way. I guess they all are. He gives you the spiritual solutions to grieving the Holy Spirit, this, grieving the sins, and he tells you a solution a spiritual solution. Uh, verse 31, let all bitterness... And th this Now, he's talked about verse 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. These are what grieves it. And then he comes down and he nails six deadly sins of the former life that are still embedded in a Christian life that must be rooted out, lifted up, and removed. And, and, and verses Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24 used three infinitives... I know I'm a little wordy here, but he used three infinitives. He said, lay aside the former life, the old man cosmos diabolical is thinking. Lay it aside by the renewing of your mind, put, then put on the new man, divine viewpoint thinking. That's Ephesians 22, 4, chapter 4, 22, 23, 24. Then he opens up in, ver in chapter 25, and he talks about what grieves the Holy Spirit, 25, 26, 27, all the way through. Then he gets down to 31, and he, 
He does what Proverbs did in 16, the seven deadly sins. He does with six and from a former life. So it's very, now what's important in my lesson today is that if, last week and today is that Paul talks about three important spiritual virtues, three virtues in verse 32. He talks about three virtues. He says, we've got to get rid of these, oh, these former sins that are still present in our life from our old life before we were saved, that it were embedded bitterness. He, just for bitterness, Hebrews 12, 15 has a root. These are things that have a root. They've been embedded. They've got and to get rid of it. You got to dig out the root, not just remove the shrub. You got to dig out the root. Uh, that's well. He taught that there are three grace virtues of the new man, divine viewpoint, which is up in verse four, twenty-four. Now in verse thirty-two, he says, and he lists them. He says. Let all, where he says, let all bitterness, let it be lifted up and removed from you. And, which is, uh, and rather than that, replace them with become, become, get on my. And that's a, that's an imperative. It's a present imperative. That's a command, become, get on my. And it means to become something, it, it means to become something you Something you were is still present. That's got to be lifted on the roof so that you can become something different. Now, you are saved. You die, you're going to go to heaven. But you've got these deadly sins. You've got, you've got certain sins that have been embedded in your life. that have got to be lifted up and removed, put away in verse 31. So that you can become... See, this is, this is all about Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24, so that you can become put on the new man, divine viewpoint thinking. And he lists three grace virtues of the new man, which are the solutions to the sins that grieve the Holy Spirit. And what he left to last were those that were embedded in us. Old habits die hard. They don't die at all unless they are lifted up and removed and the root as well. Well, in place of that, and how you do that, you study the word of God and begin digging it out. You dig out this problem in your life, bitterness. Can't get it done in a day and confession of sin doesn't remove it. It removes the sin, but not, but not the bitterness. It's been embedded. It has deep roots. You don't even think about it. Then all of a sudden you're bitter. You go from, oh, I'm happy to, oh, I'm bitter. Well, listen to the three things that replace the sins that grieve the Holy Spirit. Be kind to one another. See, their relationship, bitterness, wrath, all these, they destroy relationships. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving each other. See, it's about people, relationships in the church. And then he says, forgiving each other, be kind to one another, tender hearted. Then he says, forgiving each other. Then he says, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So my subject matter today is one of those three grace virtues is forgiving each other. Forgiving each other. And so I want to study that today. You will not do it. What he wants you to replace bitterness with is to be kind, tender, and forgiving. See? And forgiving. That's what he wants you to do. And be forgiving. And, and this forgiving each other. In other words, this is what you replace it with. You replace these sins, these embedded sins, with something different and new man, divine viewpoint thinking. Be kind, tender-hearted, 
and forgiving as forgiven. That's very important. Watch that now. Forgiven, forgiving as forgiven. So the word genomai, the word be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, that's a, a present imperative, second person plural, with emphasis on the importance of change from the former life of conformity to the world to the new life in Christ, transformity to the will of God. Transformity. Well, the other thing that's going to be of interest to us today in this lesson is the Greek word that's used for forgiving. The word forgiving and the word forgiven is the same Greek word, a different verbal form. One's a participle, forgiving, present active participle. Forgiven is an aorist, middle indicative. Now, the key is the word, charizomai, C-H-A-R-I-Z-O-M-A-I. C-H-A-R-I is, you add an S in the noun form, that's the word grace. C-H-A-R-I-S. And he uses it two different ways in this verse. He uses the same word, used it, uses it two different ways. Well, today, they, today we're going to look at three aspects of forgiving as forgiven that focuses on the Greek word charizomai. Forgiving is a participle. Forgiven is an aorist infinitive. One's a present participle, the other an aorist infinitive. And that last one, forgiven, is an aorist middle infinitive, ends in O-M-A-I. It's a deponent verb in the Greek, but still has good meaning to us. And the word you, the word you is not singular, it's dative plural, masculine. In the South, we say you all. And that means all of you. He's talking, to the, he's talking to the church at Ephesus and the believers that attended. And this is a reference to you all. Let me read it again. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you all, every believer in Christ has been forgiven. You should forgive as every person in the church has been forgiven. You should be forgiving because God in Christ forgave you. You must be forgiving to others. Well, that's where we're headed today. You've probably grew up like I did with a little saying that you've heard probably uh, many times in your life if, if you're 50 or 60, I suppose. To err is what? Human. To forgive is what? Divine. There's a good reason for that, and our lesson will certainly expose you to why that is a good idea. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it. Can't live it. In carnality, evidence of carnality in the Christian life, the Christian life. Is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins. It could be sins of the tongue, overt sins. Such like are listed in 25 through 32 or from 25 through 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, as, as some are mentioned. But there are others there. The Bible tells you what sin is. It's not a mystery what sin is. The Bible will tell you. So, like this passage does. It tells you what sin is. And sin is what grieves the Holy Spirit. And what really grieves the Holy Spirit is the, is the sins that have been embedded that is not being removed, that are a constant problem in the Christian life. Well, this is what we're going to study today. So let's have a word of prayer. Be sure you confess your sin. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the work of Christ from the cross to the Christian life. Through confession of sin restores us from carnality to spirituality. Now you're going to get something from Bible study because John 14, 26, that says the Holy Spirit 
So you want the Holy Spirit to teach you? We'll teach you and recall the truth of the Word of God. John 14, 26. Let's pray. Well, Father, here we are again on, on a Wednesday a luncheon to share with our people in their homes or wherever they are. Maybe they're in their automobiles or maybe they're out to lunch and listening, whatever, by Facebook or YouTube or whatever. We're thankful to have them. I pray today, Father, as we study forgiving as forgiven, that we might uh, have a spiritual awakening in our lives about this. And what do we have sins that have been embedded? They're just problems with us, and we we flip, we just flip into them and flip out just so quick. What do we have to do? We 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 have to lift them up and remove them, dig out the root. Uh, this takes uh, this takes the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Hebrews 4:12, the Word of God is alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrows. Watch this now and becomes a critic of the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. That's getting down to the root of it and pulling out that bad root of old man, former lifestyle that's still affecting damaging relationships in the Christian life, marriages, families, churches, nations. Encourage our hearts today, Father, to understand what it means Forgiving as forgiven, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, point number one. In Ephesians 4.32, our study passage, Paul shows that the doctrine of forgiveness, now watch this closely, is both a milk doctrine, meaning for those who have just been saved, Hebrews 5.13, and is also listed as a meat doctrine for the Christian way of life, Hebrews 5.14. Now, that's really interesting because very seldom can you find a, a, a verse that's easy to remember, forgiving just as God in Christ has forgiven you. you got both of them with the same Greek uh, verbal form, uh, the ver same ver ver verbal word. Forgiving just as also Christ has forgiven you. So let me show you what I mean. First, I want to take a look at the milk idea in this passage. First, the milk doctrine of salvation of dealing with forgiveness. A newborn babe's desire to the sincere milk of the word business. This little phrase, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And he's referring to every believer in Christ. See, he's referring to believers. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Right. So he's talking to believers who have the same common forgiveness when they believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day called the gospel. When they believed it, Romans 1.16 kicked in. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. As a result, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. It's a gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. That person is the one we're talking about here. When, he, when Paul says, just as God in Christ has also forgiven all of you, the common denominator is salvation in the gospel, is forgiveness. They have been forgiven all of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. If you haven't read those, go to our website on front page, look for free 50 things, and you will see the 13 judicial charges. You should read them because that's a marvelous thing that happened to your life the moment you believe the gospel. Whether you ever knew it or not, you need to read that pamphlet and know for sure that that's what you have because that word forgiven in there has all of that in consideration. Every believer saved by the gospel has been forgiven of their sins, past, present, and future. Not only that, but the penalties connected with Adam's sin, spiritual death and darkness, 
and condemnation and curse and all that stuff. You can read it. So that's, that's found when it says, just as God in Christ. Isn't that interesting? God, just as, watch the words just as and also. Will you do that? Just as, as an example, a comparison, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Uh, what preceded that was be forgiving. Be tender heart, be kind, tender hearted, and forgiving. Forgiving. See, the word is used twice. It demands, it demands attention. See, it's a milk doctrine that you've been forgiven. All of your all of the Adamic sin, as well as sin, past, present, and future. Christ died one death for all sin for all time. You need to read the book of Hebrews, at least chapters 8, 9, and 10. That'd be wonderful. Now, what is interesting is that normally there is a special Greek word. I'm going to spell it for you. A-P-H-E-I, no, I-E-M-I. It's spelled... A-P-H-I-E. Now, that's a compound Greek word and for forgiveness. This is a word also that's used for forgiveness in the New Testament. It has apple on the front of it, and it has the word H-I-E-M-I, which is a word. And it, what that word together means to send away, to remit, to remit. Or, or to pay in full. And it's a reference in, in context, it's a reference to Adam's original sin that's been passed on to the human race. Like in Romans 5, 12 through 21, he who knew no sin, Adam, became sin for, uh, 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 let's see, uh, he, let's see, wherefore is by one man sin in the world and death by sin, and so death was passed upon all mankind, Romans 5, 12. See, they, they alienated, blind, death, darkness, enmity, curse, condemned. And read, the, read the pamphlet. But see, there's a special word, that's, and it's used for judicial. Those 13 judicial, God judged the sins of the human race on, uh, on Jesus Christ, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Jesus is called, called the last Adam. The guy in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that's mentioned in there, that's the first Adam. That's where the fall, the fall of Adam was passed on to the human race. And judicially, there are 13 charges that have to judicially be removed. This word for forgiveness is a judicial concept. It, it means to literally to send away, to remit, or to, for, or to forgive. And it means to do it completely. All the debt canceled. Now, in Ephesians 1, 7, on your paper, if you haven't, if not, write it down on your piece of paper. You know you're supposed to bring a Bible, pencil, and paper. In him, a positional truth idea, in him, Christ, that's... I believe the gospel, and I am baptized into Christ as positional truth. We call it positional sanctification in the church age. In him, if you're in Christ, you have redemption. You have redemption through, the, through his blood. Watch this now. That's number one, redemption. If I'm in Christ, I have redemption through the blood of Christ, not through my works but through the work of Christ, his blood. Secondly, I have the forgiveness. That's our word, op hymi. I have forgiveness, that's the judicial term, of all our trespasses. Go back and read second. Go back and read um, Romans 5, 12 through 
uh, 21 and pay attention to the words transgressions and trespasses. Those are judicial ideas. 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. Watch, and he says, according to the rich of gates, we have redemption through the blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace. Here's Colossians 1, 13, 14, one of my favorite verses. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness. That's Adam's sin. That we're, everybody's born into the domain of darkness where Satan rules. He delivered us. He delivered us. Jesus on the cross, burial and resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ delivers us. Delivers us. He delivers us. He delivers. We don't deliver ourselves. Somebody else doesn't deliver us. He delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. And forgiveness, that's the same word forgiveness, judicial, Colossians 1, 13, 14. That's salvation. Very important that you understand that. You see the English word forgiveness, you got to know the Greek word to know what's the emphasis of the word. Is it judicial? That is not the word that's used in our passage. When Paul, want, wants, when Paul wanted to emphasize, now here's where our passage comes in. When Paul wanted to emphasize the importance of God's personal relationship involvement in the doctrine of forgiveness, and I'm going to say it again. When Paul wanted to emphasize the importance of God's personal involvement, personal involvement in the doctrine of forgiveness, he used a different Greek word when it says personal involvement, God in Christ doing something. That's very important. You know that. God's personal involvement in the doctrine of forgiveness. He used the Greek word charizomai, charizomai, charizomai. He used the word charizomai, coming from the word grace. It means grace bestowed. A grace bestowed. God engaging in personal involvement so that grace can be bestowed on his mercy and his love and his character. And he uses this word in our passage, verse 32, both for salvation and for the Christian way of life. See, you probably missed that. I did all that in the introduction, but I hope you're interested. Now we'll pay attention. Gerizomai, the word forgiveness used, means to bestow grace completely and unconditionally and involves personal involvement in it. And it and requires, per, it, it comes because of personal involvement. Here it is. Just as God, you see, he said prior, forgiving, just as God in Christ, that's personal involvement, also has forgiven you. And listen, and every person is equally in that, unforgi in that uh, forgiveness. Therefore, he's referring to salvation, forgiving as forgiven. Forgiving is the Christian life, forgiven is the salvation life. Boy, I hope you get this. When chrysomai is used in salvation, it emphasizes God's personal involvement, God's personal involvement in the salvation, God in Christ. This is brought out in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God's personal involvement. That's God in Christ moving the ball forward. 
This is found in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Adam sinned. Sinners, sinners because of Adam's sin, sinners as an identity or status. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. We're all born sinners in Adam. And God got personally involved in this whole idea. God demonstrated his love. See, that's that Romans, Romans 5.8. That's part of that John 3.16 idea. Or Colossians 2.13, it tells you the same story. There are a lot of verses that tell you this. When it is used in the Christian life, it becomes a meat doctrine of forgiveness in the Christian life. Like, like Ephesians 4.32, which is really interesting because in the sister book of Colossians, listen to what Colossians 3 13 says. Well, let me find Colossians 3. 13. Bearing with one another. Oh, let me read 12. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another. Forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, watch this, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So it's the same idea in the sister book of Colossians, third chapter, verse 13. When it comes to the Christian, when this word charizomai uh, is used with the Christian way of life, it becomes a meat doctrine in the doctrine of forgiveness. That's the way it is used in our passage today of Ephesians 4.32. Forgiving. See, that's the Christian. Forgiving. That's completely and unconditionally each other. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You forgive as forgiven. Note that Paul combined both of these ideas into one statement in verse 32. That's a pretty powerful idea. And it, it's, it's God's involvement in it. And our involvement should be the way God was in Christ is in us. It is God in Christ in us that is pushing this same concept as we forgive others just as God in Christ also forget, has forgiven us or all of us. Point number three in closing. Paul is commanding all spiritually advancing believers, those who study the Bible, to forgive others by bestowing God's grace of forgiveness completely and conditionally on them. Now think about that. Because that's not what bitterness is going to do. You got to root that out in order for this kind of forgiveness to take its place. Put that on. Here's Colossians 3.13. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. See? Right there in those books, he's pounding the same idea, one to the Ephesus church and one to the Colossae. To emphasize the meaning of completely and unconditionally, Jesus gave a parable of the two debtors. You need to read Luke 7, 36 through 50. You need to read it in four parts. The background. So I'm going to go over there and take a look at that with you. It's, you'll be familiar with it, but maybe not, maybe miss some of the highlights of it. Here's the first part, the background, verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him, Jesus, to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, dining table, dinner table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. 
that's not what God called her. That's what the people called her. Listen, everybody in that room that's not been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, God calls a sinner. Sometimes sinners call sinners. <laughs> you know, the kettle calling the pot black business. Behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, that a reputation. People called her a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume standing by, by, behind him at his feet. Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her hair, with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointed his feet with the perfume. When the Pharisee, Simon, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, so that's why he invited to his house, to check him out, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Don't you know that Jesus knew she was a sinner? 1 Timothy 1.15, it was for this reason that Christ came into the world, to save sinners. You ought to read Luke 19. I'll tell you, the only guy in the room that didn't believe he was a sinner was really a sinner, and that was Simon. Jesus answered and said that that's because he was religiously lost. Jesus answered and said he thought he was going to get to heaven a different way than through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, well, reply, say it, teacher. In other words, he gives him permission. And he gives him the parable of the two debtors. A certain money lender, he had two, two debtors, one owed him 500 denarii, denarii and the other 50. When they were not unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. I want you to remember that now. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Okay. Which one will love him more? So we've moved away from the background into the parable and the question. Now it's important to see the answer. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one he forgave more. more." Jesus answered, you have judged correctly. Watch this now. Watch this now. Watch this now. And turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Maybe he's got his attention off of him and Simon and wants Simon to put, the, put his attention on the woman where it was originally. I mean, he is really focused on her. I wonder if it was what type of a sinner. I'm just wondering. Well, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, a welcoming, a welcome kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, woe. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Pay attention to that word. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, there's a, there's a word we're interested in, forgiven, forgives little, loves little. Then he says to her, your sins have been forgiven. We're interested in that word forgiven. And those who were climbing at the table with him began to say to themselves, boy, they talk a lot to themselves, don't they? Who is it like we all do 
inner dialogue gets a lot of people in trouble because they don't pay any attention to what the Bible says about their inner dialogue. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. <laughs> now, in verses 7, 43 through 47, We go to 48 through 50. What is interesting that in the parable section of the two debtors, in verse 42, charisma was used. A personal involvement in grace bestowed completely and unconditionally. Verse 42. In the parable, he said, when they were unable to replay, he, the one who hold the debt, he graciously forgo forgave them both. Which of them do you think loved him more? The word graciously forgave is charizomai. He, he became personally involved in bestowing grace completely and unconditionally. In the solution section, verses 47 through 49, the word switches to apaheisma. Verse 47. This word is judicial. For this reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven judicially, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little judicially loves little. He said to him, your sins, he said to her, your sins have been forgiven judicially. Verse 49. Those who were climbing at the table began to say to them, who is this man who can judicially forgive sin? That's a powerful, powerful idea. You see how Jesus used that. But before we close this study, we should answer the question that people all, often ask us, that ask the Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Notice the word that is used there is judicial term. Apaimi. And so they thought they would go way out and say up to seven times. And Jesus gave him the famous answer, 70 times seven. Or without measure or completely and unconditionally. Our word for judicial sin is used in verse 21, 22, 27, 30, 35 in that parable of the unmerciful servant, which you should study in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 25. It's just really interesting. You see, we have been when we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have been judicially relieved, forgiven in Adam all of the judicial charges against it, 13 judicial charges. And if there are more, all of them. I just pick 13. If there's 113, they've all gone. That's God's justice and mercy dealing with the sinner. But when it comes to charisma, it requires our personal involvement. As God was in Christ, God in Christ in me must become personally involved in forgiving others. And we do it in the light of how we've been forgiven judicially. We've been forgiven judicially. The, sl wipe, the, the, the slate wiped clean, completely and unconditionally forgiven. We must become personally involved from that within the Christian life to engage God in Christ in me, forgiving others, becoming personally engaged in them understanding that I'm forgiving them completely and unconditionally.
Let me ask you a question. Should you wait until you get an apology to do it? Should you wait until they're, they make an, a public confession or whatever of that to do that? To forgive them? Do they have to do some kind of penance, run, run laps for you? What do they have to do to get back into your grace? If you say nothing, they don't have to do one thing. You couldn't be more correct. But if you've got him, them running through loops, you've missed it. Because you don't understand what you've been forgiven of. You don't put people through. That's old man. Putting people through the, through the hoops, that's old man. That's, that's old man stuff. That's bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, malice. That's what that stuff is. That's old man stuff. That's former stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not how it works anymore, Bubba. That don't work that way anymore. The old man's got to be taken off, and the new man's got to be brought up into the light of day. Stop, stop living in the darkness of the night and start living in the light of the day in Christ. My, 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 the church is so, they're so screwed up. Stop teaching these people foolishness. Start teaching them the word of God. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know you've never heard this before. Stay with me a year. Get a good Bible. Get a good study Bible. Get a Ryrie New American Standard Bible or something like that. Get you a good study Bible. None of that foolish stuff. Get a good Bible that's based on the Hebrew and the Greek. Get a, get a notebook and a bunch of pencils and come study with me a year. A year. Oh, I know, a year. Oh, my goodness. Pick out a day. At least pick one day out and stay with me a year. And you'll find out the difference between the former life and the, the old man cosmos system and the new man, the dynamics. You'll know the difference between your life being conformed to the world and your life being transformed into the will of God that's good and acceptable and perfect, Romans 12, 2. I promise you that. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come with us, for those who have come back to study with us. This lesson has to be studied several times to get it. You've got to study it. You've got to go in and look at it and study it. And what does it mean? And then transfer that information through 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired of God. Is God breathed in the King James? It's inhale, exhale of it. You've got to take it in. You've got to put it out. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Then you got to walk it out. You got to walk it out. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Father, teach him, teach him, teach him. Teach him how to get into transformational living of the new man, divine viewpoint thinking. In Jesus' name, amen.